we're going to be talking about can avoidant partners change? And in particular, we're going to be looking at three major obstacles that avoidant partners tend to come up against. So to begin, have you ever noticed that whenever you try to practice, let's say, all the sage advice about being emotionally honest and authentic with your partner, sometimes one of three things happens. And number one, that is they might accuse you of trying to make it all about you. Or secondly, they might accuse you of criticizing them just by voicing your feelings. Or thirdly, they might just completely shut down and or disappear without any explanation. And that can be super frustrating. It can also leave us feeling really confused about what's going on. These behaviors are common traits of avoidance and it does stem from boundary confusion. And when we grow up in systems that teach us to abandon ourselves for the good of somebody else, or that we are responsible for somebody else's happiness, we assume when someone else expresses an emotion that it is automatically a criticism of us. So for those that experience avoidance, they have learned to cope with that type of emotional invasion by deactivating attachment systems, which is basically disconnecting or seemingly rejecting connection. And that's because for these individuals, they have learned that to connect means self-abandonment or failure and criticism. But we all need to connect. And so you can imagine that it is a painful cycle to fall into. And so for individuals that struggle with avoidance, they usually have three major obstacles to overcome if they are to reap the benefits of a loving and reciprocal connection without fearing a loss of self-identity or personal freedom. And these obstacles are what we call ego defense mechanisms, which are the ways in which we learn how to cope with stressors. So I hope that you're going to stick with me as we're going to talk about these things here today. And before we get into it, if you are new to my channel, welcome. My name is Brianna McWilliam, and I am a licensed and board certified creative arts therapist, author, and educator with more than 14 years in the field. And it is my mission to help insecure individuals go from feeling self-doubting to self-sovereign and calling in those soul-shaking, passionate partnerships that they want without having to talk in circles around their feelings for hours or even years on end with no tangible result. And I do this using the McWilliam method, which has three major principles and tools, and that is cognitive reframing, body activation, and arts-based experiential. And so make sure that you are subscribed and or ring the bell for notifications because I put out videos on Mondays and Thursdays and I often do live stream Q and A's and I don't want you to miss out. So let's discuss these three major defense mechanisms that we utilize in attachment avoidance. And those are rationalization, idealization, and withdrawal. Now for avoidant individuals, these defense mechanisms were the ways in which they learned how to reduce conflict so as to either preserve an attachment connection or avoid feelings of anxiety around an anticipated negative response like criticism, blame, or even abuse. And so what does that look like? Well, first let's tackle rationalization. Now, rationalization is when we rationalize something painful as a way of reducing its influence and its effect on us. So for example, Mary Main, who was a pioneer in the areas of, attach of attachment research, once interviewed a woman who appeared to have an avoidant attachment style. And when she initially asked this woman to describe her childhood, she said that her childhood was fine and that her mother taught her how to be strong. Now, Maine probed a bit further, asking her to illustrate how did her mother teach her to be strong? And the woman remembered a time when she was a young girl and had hurt her arm and gone to her mother for help. The mother basically responded, to paraphrase, telling her to toughen up and not to bother her with such things. Now, days later, her arm continued to hurt, and a neighbor took a look at her and realized that the arm had actually been broken all along. So rather than paint the mother as a neglectful parent, however, this woman had rationalized her mother, um, mother's behavior by saying it taught her how to be strong. Now, avoidant partners often rationalize away someone's behavior 
which is in essence finding a la logical and or rational reason for what is otherwise unacceptable or inappropriate behavior because it preserves an idealization of that person. So that's what we're gonna talk about next is this habit of idealization. So idealization is another defense mechanism in which we have to paint a distorted picture of someone, in particular our childhood, our parents and or our partners, in order to accept a difficult or painful situation or reality about them so that we can preserve our attachment relationship and or our way of thinking about attachment relationships. So most avoidantly indivi avoidant individuals have been emotionally abandoned in some fashion in their childhood or early development. And to a child, emotional abandonment is equivalent to death. So basic survival needs associated with attachment are my parents are okay and I matter to them. Now, if the messages and the behaviors that the parents deliver to the child do not reflect the sentiment, it is there is a harmful kind of turning inwards on the self, a distortion of the self to make that somehow true. So for example, dad is in a rage and unleashed it on me again. I must have done something wrong to provoke it. I must be bad and not worthy enough. Dad is a strong and realistic man. He's just teaching me to toughen up and survive the ways of the world, right? So in this scenario, the father is being preserved as a good figure who is a strong realist. And this is the idealization. To receive punishment is thus evidence that one matters enough to be punished. Therefore, the father's behavior is just an act of love, teaching him to toughen up. And that is the rationalization. And so at the basis of this, we have to believe that I matter enough, right? And if I matter enough, then my survival needs are going to be met. And so depending on the severity of abuse, for example, over time, a child may come to feel as though they only truly exist and therefore matter when in pain or being punished. And so pain and suffering evolves into a sort of badge or the only resource or pathway that we have to connection. And so in adulthood, you attract and or are attracted to partners in which you find this kind of pain. And so said another way, on a primitive level, the attachment choice is survive with a shitty parent or don't survive at all. Now, of course, your primitive brain is always going to say, well, I choose surviving with a shitty parent. So your ego says, okay, if we're going to survive with this shitty parent, I got to figure out a way to make this work without going insane. I know. Let's make up a story about how they're not actually shitty, but how we deserve it instead. And that way we can tell ourselves that we have some control over this situation in which there truly is none. Now, after years of telling yourself this story while your young brain is developing, you also have started to construct and find evidence for even more stories that are built upon that essential premise. And that is going to color your overall worldview and perceptions and expectations of relationships in general, in particular, love, romantic, love and romantic relationships. And so in childhood, or I'm sorry, in adulthood now, you only feel connection in these emotionally tumultuous and conflictual situations. And so you either continue to rationalize and idealize uh, an unhealthy and or emotionally abusive partner and their behavior, or you turn into an emotionally um, absent and or abusive partner yourself. So as to experience that connection in the only way that you know how. Now, the third obstacle is that of withdrawal. And this one is a particularly painful cycle to be caught in. So a dismissive avoidant individual, for example, has found that remaining disconnected from an internal narrative is a lot safer and more comfortable. And so they accomplish this through a state of compulsive withdrawal, withdrawal from their own emotions and withdrawal from other people's emotions. So it looks like withdrawal from 
all emotionally difficult conversations, withdrawal from someone else expressing their painful emotions, withdrawal from someone else expressing too much positive emotion, withdrawal from group activities that may require too much of an emotional investment, withdrawal from jobs that might present a risk of failure and or humiliation, withdrawal from situations in which they might be rejected, withdrawal from situations in which they may have to voice their feelings or opinions and risk being judged or criticized or questioned for them. So if physical withdrawal is not possible, then emotional withdrawal can be accomplished in other ways and through additional forms of defensive coping. So partners who tend towards shutting down emotionally learned that in addition to rationalizing and idealizing, you can also use things like intellectualizing, minimizing, dismissing, placating, accommodating, appeasing, criticizing, clamming up, or even using humor as a deflection all of these things can reduce a risk of conflict in an emotionally charged situation. But to withdraw from all emotionally charged situations like this is kind of like cutting off your whole limb just to treat a broken bone. So in shying away from any situation that challenges a person to step out of their comfort zone and to try and fail so that they can learn from their mistakes and try again, they impede their ability to grow and experience connection in a whole new context that doesn't have to require pain and suffering or a negative self-story. And it can also lead to feelings of derealization, which is like walking through a fog or being dissociated or feeling numbed out or like nothing is really all that important and nothing matters. So in other words, when you try to avoid all the bad, you also end up avoiding all the good and you lose access to a full emotional range. And so this can often lead to more, more cynical perspectives in just about everything, but let's say in love and romance in particular. So in terms of my final thoughts on this, to answer the question, why can't my partner hear me out when I talk about something beyond the surface or I'm being vulnerable about something? It's because emotionally laden topics are deeply threatening, especially when discussed in a direct manner. And this is obviously very frustrating because evolving with a partner eventually will require some form of direct and emotionally honest and authentic communication. Now, for the avoidant individual to be able to rise to that challenge, however, they will need to contend with these three major internalized defenses. And again, that's rationalization, idealization, and withdrawal. Now, this is a difficult task because it requires unraveling a tangled web of stories that have been constructed on their self-concept and a worldview that they've had since a young age and which they believe on a subconscious level of the primitive attachment brain are necessary to their very survival. But this is not impossible. With the raising of consciousness around our subconscious stories and defenses, increasingly we start to acquire the freedom of choice in adopting and constructing what new stories we want to shape our realities. And with body activation and creativity, we can address compulsive mechanisms in the body that suppress a discharge of emotional energy and, and generate intolerable anxiety. So with the support and let's say patient attentiveness of trained professionals and our group activities with people who are not demanding of you, you can experience connection safely and attunement in ways that are pleasurable, that make the effort worth it. And as you learn to relax into those types of pleasures, your emotional range becomes increasingly rich and robust and various and your desire cannot help but expand into wanting a wanting of more intimate connection in a new and healthier fashion. And so over time, you won't see relationships as an all or nothing scenario, and it won't feel like a choice between having connection or losing yourself. Instead, it's gonna feel like a love that propels you in a new and widening direction, and you will feel like you are ready for it, and you will feel like you are capable of it. So I hope that this content has resonated with you. And if it has, I invite you to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for further notifications. Again, I put out videos on Mondays and Thursdays, and oftentimes I pop in here for live Q&As.